our EpiLife is a research project that tries somehow to explore a redefined uh, concept of well-being, the so-called uh, market of emotions, and the newly emerged happiness agenda, and the way somehow these type of entities are affecting today uh, our built environment. So the two main questions are how do we design our city today in a moment in which our emotions and feelings are constantly tracked, we know, uh, and most of all, in a moment in which uh, actually the tools that we use to analyze and uh, study um, architecture and the urban and such are kind of no longer uh, belonging to um, just you know, architectural typologies, architectural forms, but are kind of a, uh, are about moods, uh, rankings, ratings, emotional status, feelings. So we started a research investigating happiness not just as a sentiment, but as uh, Richard Layard uh, was mentioning, a new science, and as Will Davis was kind of uh, quoting with his recent work on our contemporary time and contemporary society, a pervasive industry. But why happiness and why happiness today? I think this is a, a key question to uh, uh, approach and tackle immediately. So what I'm gonna present to you tonight uh, is a sequence really of research notes. I would say to present you the context that we decided to operate with and introduce you somehow to the show. So a sort of a kind of a series of short stories that are generating the context that you will then uh, uh, explore in depth in, in the exhibition. So um, while Davis, political scientist, author of the celebrated essay on the happy industry, studying and defining our time as a condition of constant anxiety, suggested two main actions to, to take to really understand our present. The first one is about kind of a listening more and more with more attention to sociologists in behavioral studies more than the economist, more than somehow tracking uh, behaviors, uh, emotions, and actions, more than trying to check uh, uh, economical figures. And the second kind of a suggestion is about going back to the 2008, so 10 years ago, to really understand what happened uh, actually at the dawn of one of the most dramatic crash of our recent era. So uh, that's why we start here, and um, that's why we start talking about uh, constant anxiety with this photo. So uh, this is a photo accidentally taken uh, by a photographer from Reuters in London, um, the uh, 11th of September 2008. I'm saying accidentally because it was actually really taken uh, passing by, looking at uh, the facade of the building of the Lehman Brothers a Bank in London and realizing that something strange was happening. Was happening. So this is a, an image of one of the many emergency meetings that, in, I mean, that the, uh, the employees of the bank were kind of a, uh, um, uh, part of uh, five days uh, before the, the company declared bankruptcy. Uh, and uh, somehow we decided to start with this image because it's the beginning of, of uh, uh, the crash, but also it's a kind of a iconic for, as I was saying, the sort of a, a constant state of anxiety and the manifesto of the 2008. But the 2008 is also a moment that is kind of interesting and crucial for other aspects that are kind of bringing us to our research. So it's the year that Facebook is actually translated globally. You see, I mean, in all many languages and uh, 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 somehow distributed worldwide. It's also the year in which the first iPhone is distributed worldwide. We're talking about tracking uh, actions. And of course, the smartphone is a kind of a key device in this, in this sense. But also it's the moment uh, when at the political level, happiness between, I would say, ethics and rhetoric becomes part of an immediate mandate and uh, of a long-term goal for late capitalist societies. The Stiglitz report then published, you know, with this interesting cover to me for a, a broad audience with the title of Mismeasuring Our Lives, affirms how crucial is the need of going beyond GDP, just, you know, between 2007 and 2008, to measure well-being and open up the door to a multiple political acts, endorsing happiness as a potential alternative to the capital. So it's a kind of a interesting, uh, the crisis, uh, the dawn of the crisis and the use of the uh, notion of happiness at a political uh, uh, level are kind of happening at the same moment. They are kind of a complementary one integrating the other or one reacting to the other. 
the Stiglitz document uh, commissioned by Sarkozy is a sort of a, a small revolution in this idea of going beyond GDP to measure and to assess and uh, our quality of life. But um, um, it, it's a moment after the 2008 when this idea of a kind of a uh, measuring, trying to measure happiness and uh, improve our well-being becomes somehow viral uh, at the global level. Uh, in 2010, then Cameron launches a new national well-being program. Uh, in 2011, actually, the Canadian Index of Wellbeing is announced. Uh, the planet, uh, Epi Planet Index, uh, reaches to include 150 countries and is mainly focused on the idea of sustainability, uh, but again, branded as a uh, document about happiness. And in 2013, the Happiness Research Institute uh, uh, um, is founded by Mike Viking in Copenhagen. Um, in 2016, Arumi is appointed as UAE Minister of Happiness. I mean, I could go on with this type of kind of a key dates uh, 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 more and more, but I stop here. Just to give you a sense of uh, after that moment, after that critical image of the bank, uh, things started to change and the discourse uh, expands this direction. In the exhibition, you will see there are several videos where we kind of attract the discourses and the speeches where the politicians are also mentioning the word happiness and they're addressing this topic very much. Um, I, I, I would say that uh, uh, the key moment of this recent political history of happiness is maybe the 2011, when the United Nations released a declaration on happiness. And just the year after, they produce a document that is uh, the World Happiness Report, the most authorita authoritative sorry, document about assessing well-being at a global scale. And every year, the World Happiness Report is kind of integrated by the famous ranking of the happiest countries. So um, the pursuit of happiness becomes, at the sort of a media level, an obsessive competition. Uh, every year the report is published, you know, every year countries and politics are kind of uh, looking at this ranking as a sort of a, uh, the image of uh, what happiness is, checking the countries, but also kind of uh, trying to understand which are the dynamics behind all this information. So if, if uh, happiness is a, becomes a sort of a competitive uh, entity or notion, it's also a new industry I was, I was mentioning to you before. So I, I would define it as a sort of a complex ecology where there are, of course, political components, but then there is also the academia involved, research. I mean, we, we, you will find in the exhibition kind of a few excerpts of uh, the, uh, I would say, already famous class uh, about happiness, which, I mean, it is, is, is been taught at Yale by Laurie Santos. It's the first kind of academic class about teaching happiness to students. And then, of course, it's also a word of, you know, data collection companies, media entities, is really kind of produced uh, a sort of a, uh, uh, an ecology of, uh, that is both economical and of research. So, but the, the happiness industry, uh, uh, somehow it's, um, it's a dream uh, kind of a, for a better society that hides a sort of a dark side. Uh, the happiness ideology is an assertive machine pushing us to stay well and to produce more. Um, I would say it's a conformist, conformist obsessive agenda for a generic smooth life where formulas and protocols are supposed to drive us beyond the idea of the capital, but actually are pushing us in another different market. So uh, just presenting you again to give you the sense of the bulk and the amount of uh, some of the publications, I mean, connected and that are kind of uh, 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 being distributed in those years where the value of happiness is kind of a connected to economy, is becoming a sort of a status. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a full, of course, of self-help books and publication. This is a kind of a monographic issue of the magazine Monocle where the idea of how to be happy is kind of a transform in a sort of a formula. So that's why I'm saying that it's a kind of a, it's, it's, it's a generic uh, uh, agenda that is, I will describe later more into details, but it can be composed of, you know, plants and scenes uh, where to be happy we have to sit outdoor, we have to have a window to look through and have a fine dinner, sleep well, for sure, with uh, very nice pillows and uh, maybe have a good scent. Um, but then, I mean, uh, to really understand uh, uh, this so-called new agenda, we decide to look closely at the construction of the happiness reports to understand in details the topics and the type of issue they're 
focus on. So you will find in an exhibition actually a film uh, directed by Canadian director Erin Weisberger. Um, we as CCA decided to go uh, to um, the source of some of these questions. We were interested in how they were crafted uh, and how they were composed. So we went to actually uh, the Gallup headquarter in Omaha in Nebraska in the United States. Uh, Gallup uh, probably as we, all you know is uh, one of the biggest company in the world collecting data about well-being and is also kind of empowering the World Happiness Reports ranking. So it, it was really going there to kind of check the source of all this information. And, and uh, what we kind of realized was uh, uh, the relevance and the role of these type of questions uh, about well-being. I, I, I can read some of them. This is part of the Gallup or poll really focusing on the idea of well-being. And these are some of the questions that you know, are posed at the global level to people. Uh, so did you experience anger during a lot of the day yesterday? Did you experience depression during a lot of the day yesterday? Did you experience enjoyment during a lot of the day yesterday? Did you experience happiness during a lot of the day yesterday? Did you experience sadness during a lot of the day yesterday? Did you experience stress during a lot of the day yesterday? Did you experience worry during a lot of the day yesterday? Now, please think about yesterday, and then, you know, it goes on, and uh, by chance, the film by Erin is titled, Now, Please Think About Yesterday. So, you will check it later in the exhibition, but let's say, um, if you look closely at the Gallup World Poll, the World Happiness Reports, and the Global Emotions Report, uh, two key documents they used at the political level to assess the quality of our life, the core questions about well-being are interestingly moved to a sort of a subjective dimension. So questions about, about really intimate and personal status. So we move to something that is really uh, objective, like you know, questions like your income, how much do you, do you earn, to, to something that is about a, a, a kind of a, an emotional status, were you happy yesterday? And uh, I, I can say that this is a sort of a kind of a very interesting information revolution. And as Joseph Stiglitz is mentioning, the way we measure things is also affect what we do. And now we are measuring more than just income and uh, square meters of green areas, as you know, planets or urbanists. We are measuring, you know, how many friends we have, which are the I mean, role that we have, you know, uh, affections are in our life. Are we are we alone? Do we feel loneliness? Uh, time has to be flexible. You know, what is our level of freedom, the sense of belonging, uh, life expectancy, the relation with untouched nature, the sleep, we have to sleep seven to nine hours for sure, broadband access, and the role of views. So you see, we are talking of, you know, a sort of, we are moving from measuring system about objectives to subjective. So thinking to architecture, somehow the relation between the size of a house and the number of a part, a part I mean, of the inhabitants, so a sort of a kind of a, a figure, is uh, now transformed in the more relevant question is about what is the role of your home for you? What, what kind of symbol, what kind of, what kind of space uh, is kind of a, for each, each inhabitant? So uh, the happiness uh, agenda produces new special values we wanted to, to, to somehow to investigate. Uh, to, to the modern idea of space has been fully revolutionized, the domains in which we operate remain somehow the same. Nature once serving a helpful function, but as now a more iconic and eco-conservative value. Time for socializing has been reinvented, actually in light of compulsory flexibility and new parameters of security. Um, and then the concept of interior, uh, the change is, is, is about the design of new surfaces, actually, instead of new spaces. The idea of collective is challenged by the cult of private individual well-being. Um, so we compiled as a project in the project, a sort of a guide uh, for happy life uh, here at the CCA, you will find in the, in, the, in the exhibition, selecting excerpts and figures from the global reports about happiness, graphs, figures, um, subjective well-being questions, uh, imperatives collector in a volume. And we shared this information with a group of architects, um, Bovenbau architects. We asked them to transform in architectural views the dry data of the happiness agenda between abstraction and physical space, an ideal naive world of generic and specific spatial condition uh, that, takes, that takes shape. So uh, these are some of the uh, images that are kind of uh, are 
interesting to me in the sense that, that they look like, you know, uh, representation of nature as a donic pleasure, a sort of a new economy of romanticism, free time and working time that ambiguous emerge, the real estate as a market of inti intimate dreams, uh, the urban as an environment shaped by atmospheric parameters. And uh, you, will, you will find all these images in the exhibition. It's a kind of interesting that is that the naive uh, uh, character, the sort of a role of uh, uh, kind of a views uh, out of a windows where we kind of imagine a sort of an ideal uh, epic city uh, were produced with a brief that was exactly the type of information that you've seen before. So from dry data to a sort of an idealistic or ideal image of what uh, the generic uh, epi life could be. But then, I mean, uh, again, during, during the process of construction of, of the exhibition and the research, I mean, from the uh, ideal scenario, at least in the attempt of trying to check what, what all these data were producing in order to try, I mean, this, this collage was really about how do we visualize this world. Uh, we, we said ourselves, I mean, with the, the curatorial team, we have to test the happiness agenda. We have to look at uh, somehow at our reality. So what, I, what I'm trying to present you here, it's really a kind of a short selection of, of a set of extraordinary story from our banal reality, selected in the attempt of understanding how the happiness agenda is directly and indirectly affecting the built environment. Each story, rather than pretending to compose a certain exhaustive panorama, serves as a tool to produce a question. This is the goal of the entire exhibition, I would say. I would really uh, love if each of you at the end of the show could just get out from the exhibition with doubts, questions, and you know, uh, some uh, less certain ideas about how to react to our contemporary time. Um, each story, uh, um, each of these stories doesn't kind of address design per se, but rather confront with some of the crucial economical, social, emotional, po po political conditions, sorry, that influence the way in which we construct and inhabit our building and cities today. So it's a series of questions and uh, um, so, this is a, these are some documents, actually, uh, uh, flyers, commercial flyers from uh, Atlanta Marriott building. So the, the Marriott uh, iconic hotels were designed by John Portman in the 80s, and they were a manifesto of a luxurious corporate idea of travel. You know? The idea of comfort there was about somehow a multiplicity of function interiorized in each single room. In those, I mean, really the early 80s was the access of two uh, global TV channels, radios, the service in the room, and you know the shopping in this sort of interiorized world, and so on. But today, Delos, uh, a company pioneer in the construction of uh, what is called the wellness real estate, somehow inject a new layer in the refurbishing of the Portman Hotel rooms. Antitoxic material, pseudo natural surfaces, color treatments to wall, in order to simulate sunset, dome simulators and gravity blankets somehow. Happiness today is not about design of a space, uh, but inserting in our architecture a sort of a new layer uh, of materiality, uh, a sort of a different atmospheric condition. Hidden in the heart of a generic North American hotel, a standard hotel room has been kind of designated as a potential site where the highest level of comfort and maximum happiness is possible. Sleeping uh, is somehow totally dehumanized today. Uh, it's again, it's part of a, it, it, become, it becomes a sort of a, a, a something that we can buy. This is a kind of a connect our, uh, as our discourse between the idea of the surface to the idea of happiness and the uh, uh, architecture of happiness as a way of furnishing spaces more than designing. So this is a gravity blanket that is supposed to kind of a, uh, be, be very heavy on your body in order to kind of uh, uh, stimulate and facilitate your, your kind of a, a, a sleep condition, like feeling another person somehow touching you or staying on you. 
Still, I mean, I was mentioning all the kind of a gadget and kind of a dome simulators are kind of a part of our economy today. Till arriving, you know, to the uh, uh, um, object producing sound, it's very interesting how then the, you know, the type of sound that of course all these kind of small devices are proposing, uh, a wide wave, a wide noise, of course, the, the zoo sound, the Tokyo temple rain. So it's really, again, it goes back to atmosphere, go back to uh, uh, an emotional component. Still devices about controlling the radiation. So, um, and um, um, this brings us to the idea of somehow again, the, the, the intimacy. Uh, so, um, um, recent, recently built uh, 300 Ashland is a um, mm, real estate development designed by architecture firm 10 Architectus and James Cornfield Operation uh, and is a kind of a new, I mean, it's a hot spot in Blue Queen today in New York. Developers offer to actually Instagram star uh, Tevi Gavinson the possibility to live in one of the apartments of the block and to post online photos for her most intimate and private life. So, I mean, we know that while, while celebrities are kind of an endorsing uh, products online today, this is a kind of a not new for us. But the fact that the real estate has started kind of a sponsoring content on social media is a sort of a new territory to explore. So how do we imagine to conceive and design an apartment today in an age in which the images that somehow we use to sell it or to promote it are intimate and private corner of space like these ones? Another question, another quick point. Uh, what does it mean home to you today? Uh, maybe some of you is kind of a familiar with this uh, super popular TV show in North America. House and Garden Television Channel is the fourth most watched TV uh, show in North America. And the huge success of the show about the house flipping uh, as produced after the 2008 as sort of a small urban uh, revolution. Huge number of people somehow left their job to move into a market of the flipping, seduced by the dream and apparently easy kind of a task of transforming and refurbishing houses as a sort of a new flourishing market with the idea of transforming a place and making it like a sort of a dream house for, for somebody else was kind of uh, interesting. These TV shows, of course, they contain a narrative that is strongly emotional and is really seducing. And uh, only in Phoenix, in 2017, thousands and thousands really of houses have been flipped by a uh, new entrepreneur with somehow no knowledge of the market and of the practice of transforming the area in a sort of a new urban settlement designed by aspiration and TV dreams. We were discussing about this, we were, I was mentioning to you also before this type of uh, the role of the home and we decided to kind of address this idea or this question that is in the happiness report and in the happiness agenda is always mentioned what is the role. Uh, talking about also another component of the happiness agenda that is kind of a, we need to have broadband access to really be happy today. Um, and uh, I mean, broadband access is really one of the uh, uh, most listed amenities that I mean, the, among the key indicators of the Global Happiness Report. Internet and technology were driving new gig kind of economies, are also somehow disrupting conventional idea of families. Uh, Wi-Fi family, as defined by the New York Times in uh, uh, an article in October 2018, are contemporary breed of nomads. The Gillespies, in this case, these are uh, a family we were talking about and were sort of protagonist of our exhibition. We had a very interesting kind of a FaceTime call with them that is in the show as a piece. Um, the, the, this family that you see in this, is in, in this photo is one of the most famous Wi-Fi family uh, at the mediatic level. The Gillespies, they travel constantly with their kid uh, from you know, one country to the other without a home, taking photos of themselves with drones cameras and branding themselves as unsettled down. No house and an image of you know, themselves kind of uh, uh, transported from the reality into the digital economy. Um, what's the real threshold of a house today? Um, and, and I think this is another story I love to mention among the many, I mean, I'm really selecting some of them to give the character of our exploration of, of the bright and the dark side of the happy life. 
uh, the, the happiness protocols are pushing us to stay up to date with technology and to kind of uh, use it technology. Our smart home lockers that can be activated remotely from any part of the world, from our mobile phones, of course, are redefining the idea itself of the treasure and of the home. Where is really the limit once, you know, opening a door can happen from every uh, part of the world. But of course, we, we wanted to investigate this story from a precise angle, but somehow it's kind of a more dramatic and, 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 and tough. Uh, that one of the domestic abusers were actually hacking our device and breaching into our private life through the digital space. So if the notion of the threshold has to be redefined and legally regulated today, what's real the boundary of, of our private space? And this is an image of Ruth Patrick that actually is uh, a figure in California who's actually protecting uh, women uh, uh, who have been kind of uh, affected and uh, uh, problems of domestic abuse through technology. So the idea of exploring architecture and the idea of threshold, not kind of entering into the space or the physical space of the threshold, but entering into the law that is trying to protect what, what is a threshold today. This is a really interesting, uh, or I mean, uh, to, to highlight or important to highlight for me because it's, it's it's, it's really part of the character of the show, entering to the boundary conditions of what is architecture today to really understand what is architecture, even if maybe you won't find a plan and a section in the exhibition. Another question. Uh, within the project of happiness, our, our relation with nature has become something staged and transactional. Question to all of you. So, Alongside uh, rapid urbanization, uh, China has been creating forest cities as part of an ecological uh, policy to compensate for pollution and attend to the well-being of growing metropolitan middle class. Trees have become a precious commodity with prices depending on rarity, size, and age. Already existing trees are often displayed in favor of older, grander ones from rural areas to, ev to evoke a sense of authenticity. This is, goes back to what we were talking about. So nature maybe is not just kind of a, as, a, as a sort of a belonging to the modern idea, uh, an helpful uh, kind of a condition or uh, uh, something that is kind of a, uh, uh, affecting our body as an helpful kind of a, a status or thing but uh, it's an image of nature that is comforting and reassuring us. So I think this is a, a photos by artist and photographer, uh, Young Preston, of uh, some of these old trees uh, uh, moved and transplanted from you know, rural areas to the big metropolis of, of China. Till arriving, I mean, this, this is a kind of a interesting uh, uh, and rare, I mean, a, an, it's an original story specific. I mean, there's this, this, this tree that it looks like just a big old archaic tree is actually composed of metal pipes and, you know, wrapped up with this sort of a gold plastic uh, 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 foil or whatever uh, in order just to look big and to look old. Uh, and, you know, it's just full of pipes. Um, The massive, and then it's interesting because the massive industry of transplanting uh, nature uh, in this specific context in China mirrors the intensive migration occurring in those regions, challenging also the notion of homes and belonging stability. So some of, I mean, of course, it's a matter of buying trees, uh, 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 getting some monies, and uh, some money, sorry, and then some of the population in the village uh, uh, they move according to you know to the urn that they can make selling this sort of uh, iconic big trees. So for us, the story about the trees is not just about the economy of nature, the idea of staging nature, but also migration in a country. Something about a specific architecture office here. Um, Fort landscape architects, uh, basically in Zurich, um, they're, they're kind of uh, rooting their practice on the idea of designing parks and green areas as a sort of a diorama. A reconstruction through a landscape architecture project of an historical fragment <coughs> of nature, sorry, of a real piece of history for our physical territory. So the idea of kind of a reconstruct, I mean, designing uh, 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 parks and architecture and uh, um, landscape architecture sites 
kind of a restaging kind of an old condition or archaic condition of nature is part of their practice. And this, this is a kind of an original case. In the case of the Novartis campus in Basel, uh, uh, the office decided to bring taxidermies into the terrain of the park and of the project. I don't know if you are able to spot the hair that is in, in the room. So somehow wilderness is uh, completely reconstructed artificially and the project in the practice of the studio is documented as a living diorama series of photos. I mean, and uh, uh, um, apparently some employees of the Novartic campus uh, 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 after having seen these photos, they thought actually that the park was super wild place, but it was not. But it's, it's a kind of interesting for us to imagine an architecture office that is playing with this topic and, and with the idea of kind of a stage in nature today. Another question is, is sustainability a personal purchase or a collective affair? <clears throat> so uh, this is a story that comes from uh, the Nordic regions. So those that are always on top of the world happiness uh, ranking. In this case, this is a, an activity called uh, Plogga. I don't know, maybe some of you uh, know uh, what we're, I'm talking about. It's a sort of a plug. is a portmanteau of the word jogging and picking up in Swedish. So the idea of running and, and jogging during the day and, and, and then uh, collecting garbage at the same time. So working out even more because you squat, I mean, and, and you collect garbage. And uh, uh, the interesting thing is that the Instagram feed of the ploggers and plugga is probably one of the most kind of a, uh, seen and with a huge number of posts ever in Sweden. So it's a kind of interesting for us the fact that it's somehow, again, this idea of contributing to the environment is a sort of a, a generous collective act, but you do that constantly taking photos of yourself doing that and posting on, on, on social networks. So what is the boundary, what is the limit between, you know, uh, generosity, volunteering, that is also one of the key aspects of the happiness agenda, and promoting yourself to a level that is becoming even obsession. You know, we know how, how much we are check, how, how many times in a day we are checking our Instagram feed to understand how many likes we are taking. And, and so this is a kind of a, this is to me is the story, imagine uh, in the city, uh, uh, this type of situation. And then we have, we have also a, a, a piece by artist Simon Fujiwara, who is also a kind of a, um, we're very happy that we managed to also involve in, the, in, the, in our book uh, that it's actually a trash bin, a German trash bin, coated in bronze. Uh, Simon Fujiwara has been working in the last years on uh, the relation between the concept of happiness and uh, uh, in, in Germany, um, and uh, collecting garbage, recycling in the best way is apparently in his research, I mean, as a is a kind of a, a, a described as one of the German obsession. I mean, if there's some Germans in the crowd can tell us if it's true or not. But I mean, this type of, you know, uh, trash beans, they can cost still to 200 euros. And, and they're kind of a, 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 a super precise high-tech technology. And Simon decided to make a series of them to really, again, talk about, you know, which is the limit between uh, uh, you know, being perfect in kind of collecting the things that you, you, you have to recycle and transform in this sort of a practice in a sort of a monument or a sculpture of, you know, recycling. Um, so many of the stories included in the exhibition are about legal acts, uh, political shifts, uh, economic parameters, and urban anomalies, somehow produced directly and indirectly by this new agenda of assumed happy values, no? So what's the role of darkness? These are some, some also the other kind of a question that we'll find the exhibition in designing our city and the whole region. How do we react to light pollution? Uh, how, many how many times have, we, have you seen the sky and the stars in, in, in the last days? How much risk can I take to live in the land of my dream today? Uh, what does freedom exactly mean within an economy of compulsory flexibility? And <clears throat> Some of the many interesting chapters of the EPIC protocols are about the role of the view um, as crucial to affect mental health, we know. The WELL protocol is extensively talking about it. Can we regulate sky? Can we design the color of our atmosphere? Um, we did some research on that, you will find in the exhibition some stories, but there's one specific I'd love to talk to you about. Um, uh, that is about uh, Airbnb on the way in Spain. We know our, our uh, companies are, uh, as Airbnb are selling today more than uh, 
uh, a, a kind of a, a just you know a setting or kind of a allowing you to rent out an apartment or a room. Uh, there's, they're kind of a promoting touristic experiences uh, within the domain of the sharing economy. Um, many city centers of cities uh, are affected by uh, the phenomenon of renting it out through the sharing economy, and the phenomenon seems really unstoppable, and it's kind of a really a transforming the perception of uh, uh, the city and the city centers in itself. Um, Valencia, this year, kind of a promulgated a specific law to regulate the tourism in town between private homes and hotel owners. The city decided basically to ban the use of any flat for vacation uh, above the first floor uh, of a building. So uh, this sort of idea that the view is somehow reforming an industry and is stratifying the city. So the image that you see now is part of one of the many commissions that are uh, 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 we did for this exhibition, uh, BRBR Films, uh, architects and filmmakers based in Madrid have been kind of a working with us to compile a sort of a visual section of the city of Valencia. Uh, 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 in, on, on the bottom of the image, uh, the crowd of tourists in the city center of, of the town. Uh, uh, the image in the center, we send them to an Airbnb in Valencia now, and you can see, I mean, the, the view is blocked. They stayed there, they filmed, but this is the type of view that you can get. And then the rooftop of an auto. So somehow it's very interesting for us to understand how a phenomenon that is totally immaterial, connected to the idea of mental health, is producing a kind of a idea of stratification of the city and also a type of scenario of, of this type. And then one, of, I mean, the very last story. So um, uh, this, this sort of a weird photo, um, According to, to, to lawyers of the Pacific View Rights Center, an, oce an ocean view can add up to a million of dollars to value your property. The Pacific View Rights Center is a collaborative uh, um, of property owners, developers, real estate brokers, attorneys, and architects. who are actually sharing resources for interpreting and defending the right of a view, specifically in California. So this is a, these are images you will find the case that is an exhibition, specific case of an AC machine obstructing a view toward the sea. As an interesting case for us about, you know, debated in the court about uh, the legal processes, the economy debates, and the architectural definition of what is, of what is a view. Um, so from a story of uh, everyday reality, the possibility of looking out of our window and trying to understand effectively if the view is blocked or not, we, we wanted to highlight the tension around one of the most valuable assets connected to, pro to property today. So when we somehow go, um, um, we explore the level of happiness of countries, we have to reference to the World Happiness Reports. When we want to try to understand the quality of life and the level somehow of uh, happiness at the level of the cities, it's not anymore foundations or states that are kind of producing this type of information, but private companies and magazines. So here we are listing some of the most influential uh, uh, monocle uh, who is, that is releasing every year uh, uh, a sort of a survey on the uh, most livable 25 cities in the world. But it's also interesting to see, we talked about for you know, the Delos case, how uh, the well community standard is also ranking and producing somehow uh, the greenest district uh, uh, in the world and uh, uh, listing uh, 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 data about a uh, um, specific topic in this case, uh, uh, green. To arrive to the Economist Intelligence Unit, so also the Economist uh, that is releasing in the last in the last days in the last two years, actually one of the most influential and uh, checked and controlled index, that is the Safe Cities Index, uh, trying to somehow uh, detect you know which is the happiest and most livable city according to specific topic. In the exhibition, we have uh, three stories: one about Tampa connected to the Well Standard. The other one about Tokyo, the most kind of a, the safest city in the world according to the Economist Intelligence Unit, and Copenhagen, and Copenhagen as a bike paradise. It's a, it's a sort of a kind of a very interesting for us to uh, uh, explore how from a welfare kind of idea of 
uh, planning where services were kind of uh, provided uh, uh, to the cities and somehow we are entering in now in a sort of a um, competitive realm of planning where cities are actually trying to brand themselves uh, in order to kind of attract a different type of inhabitants. So uh, in the exhibition we will find how you know the ranking idea is becoming interconnected to planning and how the idea of branding a city is becoming more and more crucial as a tool to kind of a design uh, a urban context. So to arrive to a sort of um, final, I mean, one of the final questions or provocation <coughs> that we decided to, sorry, to put together, um, that is about who is really designing, who is really kind of a taking care of the image and, 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 and and planning strategies of our city. So we put together different photos actually of uh, the offices where the ranking are produced, trying to kind of contrast this idea or at least push you to think about who is the real designer of our cities today, our architecture offices, planners, or the producer of the ranking, who is kind of collecting the data, who is kind of promoting this idea of a competition among, among cities. So these and many other stories have been part of our research. To present here today a landscape of doubts, uh, critical issues, and questions we have decide, that we have decided to, to rise tonight. A world of surfaces, constraints, protocols, an agenda that actually we cannot escape since it's presented to us as the best possible option to reach an happy life, but that of course hides a system of imperatives, norms, that transform uh, emotional condition in marketable entities. And then the idea of reaching well-being, just a compulsory, solitary obligation. So today and in the next years, in a climate of ecological disaster and dramatic migration, we have as architects to find a way to react to this conformist agenda that is somehow producing a revolution in the way we look at the world. So how we will react as architects at the digital emotionalization of our space, how we will react uh, to urban planning as a competitive practice among cities, how we will react to the idea of sustainability just as a personal pursuit. So hope that this exhibition will pose these and uh, many other questions to you and that uh, uh, we will try, uh, I mean, to in the next years to give some replies and to check uh, which are, you know, the possible horizons in front of us. Um, the exhibition will be followed by actually a public program of conversation where we will invite uh, uh, architects to kind of uh, debate with us and to try to answer some of the questions that the exhibition posed. Uh, the first guest that will be with us will be uh, Rainier de Graaf from uh, OMA, discuss, I mean, which are uh, somehow the possible reaction to this uh, agenda. And I'm looking forward to discuss also with you. Thank you.